Hello, everyone. Welcome to Adult Education 101. It's really nice to see you all. Um, before we start, I wanted to let you know that this session is recorded and will be available um, as for the different resources for you after. We're very excited to welcome you to the first après cours of 2021-2022. My name is Naomi Terrien. I'm the pedagogical consultant for the Sir Wilfrid Laurier School Board. And um, I'm here today with uh, the EPC members, English Pedagogical Consultants. Um, tonight we are visiting or revisiting for some of you, the adult education basics and resources available. On today's agenda, we will um, touch on uh, andragogy, the adult ed services roadmap, followed by a description of the different uh, services and we'll finish with a Q&A session about the questions raised in the survey you answered. Uh, thank you again for being here and without further delay I give the floor to Julie Robitaille. Hello everyone so my, I'm Julie Robitaille from Equipe Chac Pedagogical. I am in charge of languages and social sciences and I work alongside Ms. Micheline Amaha, who is the best out there. So I'm here to talk to you about the difference between pedagogy and andragogy. Uh, so it's very basic. If we look at the language basis of both words, uh, um, we are going to see right away that both come from the Greek. And as you can see, andra is the, uh, the prefix that means man and PED, P-E-D, is related to boy or child. So both in, in these cases, both are leaders. But andragogy is, uh, means leader of man and pedagogy means leader of child or boy. In this case, you can see that the difference is simply the audience that we are taking care of. So <clears throat> in our next slide, we can see the components of pedagogy and andragogy. As you can see on the left, Pedagogy is organized more in a triangular uh, shape where you have the teacher that is giving instructions, giving uh, evaluation that uh, is pretty much the center of uh, the actual gesture or the action of teaching. Of course, we like to think that students are at the center of their own learning, but pedagogy is so organized as the teacher is in charge of making sure that everything happens. Whereas in andragogy, all the arrows are pointing towards the center, meaning that there is a, a negotiation happening and a, um, a collaboration happening. And that is what makes andragogy different than pedagogy, because all of the people involved must also be at the center of decision making, or at least, uh, you know, discussion around the decisions that are made. So more specifically, if you look at the chart, we can see that the components are the same in pedagogy and in andragogy. So at the far left, you have the planning, the needs, the diagnosis, and the objective setting, which in one case is done by the teacher. And then in the other case, the case that we are most interested in right now, the andragogical aspect is done by mutual assessment. Whereas learning designed in a logical sequence can be sequenced by readiness when, in, when we talk about andragogy. Learning activities are usually transmittal techniques that are done by the teacher to uh, a community of learners. And in the case of andragogy, we are looking at uh, consists of projects, modules, process of inquiry, experiment, anything goes because of the uh, going back and forth and the conversation between the adult learner and their teachers, then it's possible for the, uh, the learning activities to be modeled and to be done in a different way. As for evaluation, they are done by teacher and graded on a curve, uh, sometimes not so much, sometimes very much so, whereas in andragogy, it's done through a learner collected evidence uh, basis and it's validated most of the time by peers and by experts. So again, there's this back and forth the two pointed, the, 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 the arrow that's pointed in two directions at once. Uh, 
Dana Bryson is a, uh, a very, very interesting uh, researcher and very much interested in andragogy. And he is one who made uh, a very, uh, a very interesting research uh, that dates back four years, it's 2017. And in, uh, in uh, his particular teachings, we look at teaching and uh, dialogue and learning and engagement and growth, discovery and knowledge and application, all are as interchangeable items. And that's the most interesting part uh, of Bryson's uh, research is that when he says teaching is dialogue, he also means that dialogue is teaching. And when it says learning is engagement, then engagement is also learning. Growth is discovery, discovery is growth, knowledge is application, application is knowledge. And whatever you do with it, whichever way you look at it, it always works. And sometimes turning it over on its head works best. So uh, these slides are probably going to be made available to you, but I do encourage you to look at James, uh, David Bryson, sorry, uh, Bryson 2017. He is awesome and uh, an amazing researcher. So thank you for your time. I hope this cleared up a few little things, questions you had about andragogy. Hey, uh, thank you so much, uh, uh, Judy, for that that outline. You're welcome. Um, I'm just thinking of you know uh, how keen I am to bring that back to my team and have those sort of conversations. And you know, um, adult learning is going to look is going to look different. You know, at in every setting. Um, in every in every center in every classroom, but I think these make for interesting discussions for for educators to have uh, together. What what is what is the practice of andragogy um, look like at my center? Um, okay, uh, so I put together a little uh, adult education services roadmap. Um, now I I assembled this in such a way that once you receive um, your copy of this Google Slides presentation in, in, in its entirety, you can refer to this particular section um, and explore it on your own. You'll notice that there's a back button on each slide. I'm not gonna use that now. Mark is just gonna be taking uh, me through the slides, um, but you'll be able to go back and forth between the various slides to explore each, um, uh, in, in order to be able to refer to each service as you like, and you also see that there's an acronyms page that you might find handy. So if you do share this with your um, colleagues um, back at your centers, and I, I hope you do, um, if they couldn't make it to this app by core, they can still benefit from getting, you know, um, a context and, and a greater understanding of how everything is mapped out in adult education. Um, so here on the title slide, um, I went with like a roads theme because I'm a sucker for templates and I also, you know, thought it was cute, but it does, um, you know, um, I, 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 it, it is a good way to organize information too. It's a good pedagogical practice. It's laid out. Um, there, there's a sensible way or a sensical way of, of navigating um, the, the slides. So up first we have EPC um, and then we have ACAP shock, um, RACI, um, AGE, AJAC and proceed. Now I put them in order, not in order of importance, um, but in order of the, um, the, the resource or the support network that I feel like teachers would encounter first. Um, and that should make more sense as we, as we go through this, but you're less likely to deal with proceed um, than you are with say EPC. Okay, so that's the rationale there. And also I don't wanna forget, we have the SECA2T, um, so, or sorry, I think it's AT2. Sorry, Abby, if I got that wrong. No, it's A2T? Yes. A2T. Okay, excellent. So um, I didn't want to forget our friends, Abby and Karin. So I put them there, not smaller, because they're less important, because they're also part of these other committees, but they're kind of between AKEEP Shock and RACI Edge, if that makes sense. So that's that was the rationale for the way I created that. I just wanted you to sort of, I guess, understand how my mind works as I put this together for you, because it'll help you navigate it. Okay, so I'm not going to go through this um, in its entirety. Each slide, um, I've used color in a way so that it's common on each slide. So each slide talks to you about the mandate of each organization um, or group, the members, so what types of um, professionals are involved in, these, uh, in, in this particular group, the projects, the current projects that the group is working on that you can become involved with, and then the contact. If you're interested in EPC, whom do you contact to get involved? 
Okay, so that is on every single slide and the colors match on each slide because again, I like that, but it's also a good way to organize information because it's consistent. There's also a link to the website there for EPC. Um, and so EPC is our English Pedagogical Consultants Network. And we've got folks um, from every center involved with EPC. Okay, next up, there's Lake Keep Shock Pedagogical. All right, um, the mandate is there. We've, um, they're going to get into their mandate in depth, so I'm not going to go over it here. There's three projects they have uh, ongoing, at least, uh, that you could become involved with. So workshops similar to these, um, but there's also newsletters that you should keep an eye out for and subscribe to. And they also have a list of resources by subject and the contacts that are there, Michelin and Julie, and then they have their website. Okay, Racy Taj. Um, Racy is a really big acronym, so I put that on the left for you. What is their mandate? You've probably been involved with some RACI folks. If you haven't um, yet, you should. Um, and the current projects and contacts, I merged there. So you've got the current pro the projects that are going on with RACI, but also the people you can contact to get involved. Um, and all of them are here today. So um, you'll be able to ask them questions later on if you want. Also the website uh, for RACI is there too. Okay, Ajax. This is um, a committee that gets together every month or two um, or, or three, depending. Um, and this mostly involves administrators and consultants. And we find kind of find out what's going on in the different centers, but also talk about exciting things like budgets. Um, you know, not really exciting. I, I think my delivery, my tone was off. My delivery was off my tone there. But we do talk about cool things. We get to see each other and know what's going on across the province, which we then report back to you. So it's super important. Proceed. So you might have heard of Proceed, another really big acronym. Um, I've broken it down for you there. This is uh, uh, an organization that it uh, involves a center directors primarily. And as you can see from their mandate, um, they're dealing with like really big business in adult ed. Right. And then the key is if all this is working, all these roads, all this information gets back to and leads back to you, um, the, the, the teaching staff. All right, these are the acronyms. So I used to be a teacher, right? And when I started, people were like, oh, um, you know, uh, have you worked on your LDS? And I was like, oh, what? You know, oh, are you, are you teaching CCBE or DBE? You know, are you going to AQEFGA? And I'm like, you know, I don't, I, don't, I don't speak this language of acronyms. I don't know what you're talking about. So um, I compiled a list of the acronyms that I think you're most likely to encounter and they're broken down for you there. And wherever there's a relevant website, I included that um, for you there. So they're there in the roadmap style, but listed alphabetically. So again, you can come back to this. If ever someone throws an acronym at you, you can even try to memorize some and impress your friends and look really cool at work, right? Especially proceed, if you can remember that one, you're in with the cool kids. So thanks for your attention. Check those out and have fun navigating the acronyms and the various services. Uh, Matthew, that was so cute. I love it. And I feel like I know where I'm going. And even though I'm a part of all of these things, um, welcome everybody, uh, teachers and consultants alike. Um, we're so excited for our first app like cool this year. Um, I'm a member of the EPC committee or the English Pedagogical Consultants, and we are going to beat the teachers over the head this year with that acronym so we don't get asked anymore, who are you? Um, we work collaboratively and meet minimum once a month uh, with our partners in RACI and Ekip Shock uh, Pedagogical. Um, to assess the needs of teachers, to plan for the year, the, the professional development and supports that we're going to be offering. Uh, the members of our committee are listed here. We're numerous and many, and uh, we work in subcommittees as well sometimes. Um, if you don't see your school board listed, uh, that's, well, New Frontier, uh, Eastern Townships, uh, Shanna just joined us a couple of weeks ago. Um, and if your school board is not listed here, uh, that does not mean that you're not entitled to or cannot receive support from EPC members. Uh, you would just need to let your administrator know and one of us or many of us will uh, take you under our wings uh, if there's no consultant available to you. Um, our mandate 
is we're a working group. We are a subcommittee of Proceed, uh, founded in 2014, and our sole purpose for existing is to support adult educators within the nine English school boards. Um, and we work uh, collaboratively with uh, many of the First Nations boards as well. Um, we work together to identify teachers' needs, uh, create and present interactive workshops. Uh, this is our new format uh, at the Après Cours. Uh, provide individual coaching and um, organize professional development projects in the adult ed sector. Uh, so this year we have two major projects going on. Uh, one of them you're currently involved in because we're doing Après Cours uh, throughout the course of the year. Um, we split our après cours between Ekip Shuk, who will handle the subject-specific après cours, and then everything that was sent out in our survey uh, mid-September that teachers identified that was more cross-curricular, so applicable to no matter what subject you teach, um, the EPC committee is going to handle those, so first one being Adult Ed 101. Um, we have a number of exciting workshops lined up with some expert uh, presenters throughout the course of the year, so stay tuned because we're excited to unveil uh, our upcoming workshops. Um, at the same time, we're also running a longer um, project. Uh, it's a two-year project on blended learning. Uh, we didn't want to lose what happened last year in the province, all of the learning that teachers experienced and all of that growth. Um, and so we wanted to capitalize on everybody's experiences and uh, take everybody one step further. So we're learning about, uh, as consultants, we're learning together alongside um, specific teachers on blended learning. And then next year, that's going to blow out into a bigger project where we involve more teachers. Thank you, Nicole. That was awesome. Um, well, my name is Micheline Amar. I'm also part of the Equipe Shock Pedagogical, and I, of course, you got to to see my uh, my uh, my colleague Julie in action. She's uh, super thorough, but she's awesome. So um, you see, our team is um, our main mandate is really to support the English speaking adult general education network uh, in terms of curriculum. So if you have any questions in terms of content, um, program implementation, uh, development of program. If you have, uh, uh, if you're having trouble uh, in, in, in even uh, creating uh, any content in, or you wanna be part of a bigger picture, be part of a working group that develop uh, content uh, in terms of discipline, we're the one you will reach out to. Um, of course, uh, all our uh, all our work is done in collaboration with our partners. Of course, we we're talking about EPC, MRC, and uh, and of course, Proceed, AJAC, and of course, we can't forget SAC, which is the Service Complementaire, and AVI, the uh, uh, Assisted Tech. Um, it's it's a teamwork. This is all teamwork. It takes a village. To, to service our, our, our students. So we, 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 we need all of us to get together to do so. So uh, that being said, uh, we're also responsible of also diffusing information, uh, training session or workshop. We're the middleman in between all the information that happened in, ministry, in the ministry in terms of curriculum. We get the information of like, what's what changed in terms of rubrics, uh, programs, uh, anything that discipline related. We get this information and we bring it to you, teachers. And if there's any specific training with new um, new implementation and new course that's going to be offered, uh, we're the one who 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 brings you the information and help you put information uh, build curriculum together. Uh, that being said, uh, please I invite you to register to subscribe to our newsletter, which is a monthly newsletter. We get access to all of this information or anything new, and also we have the uh, Age website that at your service where we put all our curriculum, our discipline content um, uh, that is shared across the province. So all teachers across the province. Uh, uh, curriculum put together on a website for you to share and we even have pretest if that if that's a deal breaker <laughs> anyways thank you everybody for uh for uh coming um uh, and we'll be reaching out or you're more than welcome to reach out thank you thanks Ms. i think i'm next oh sorry i went too fast
We have our uh, our guest Karine and Avi talking about uh, service complement, educative complementaire, and the A 2 T project. Go ahead. So hi everyone. Hi. My name is Karine Jacques. I'm an orthopedagogue for the service educative complementaire, and I work with Avi. Hello everyone. So I'm the project lead for accessibility and assistive tech. It's called the H T project. Um, I'm part of the RSC-AGE team and I work very closely with Karine Jacques and we'll be talking a little bit about what we do in the next two slides. So Karine, over to you. So I can work with you for the HRVT centers to help students, to, uh, to help teacher for uh, um, disabilities or adult needs and to get some strategy. Uh, so if you have any question, you can call me and. Uh, just write an email. So we'll talk a little bit about what we can do to um, to support you. So a big thing that we're starting this year is that we're working side by side with resource teams, resource teachers, special ed techs to explore any type of assistive tech software like WordQ or Read and Write, uh, Mercer Reader, Equatio, you name it. Um, and we're looking at how these software, how these assistive tech tools can be used with all students, not mm -hmm. just those with diagnosed and undiagnosed learning disabilities. Um, that's something we can offer to do, Karine and I. In terms of accessibility, um, support with accessibility means making, helping centers make documents, online resources, classroom environments more accessible. And, in two and a half minutes, I'll try to give a quick example. So for example, if we were looking at distributing online documents, we might work with the resource team to look at fonts or background colors or things like spacing, just to make things more readable for students uh, with let's say dyslexia or another learning disability. Um, or we might show you how to use tech uh, to provide both written and verbal instructions, those type of things. And again, same theme as before, the great part is that all students can benefit when documents or environments are more accessible, whether they have a disability or not. Um, we're also happy to work with you if there's any initiatives around um, universal design for learning. Hi, Sonia and Nicole, that was a lot of fun. Um, flexible learning spaces, RTI, anything along those lines, just please reach out to Karine and I, and uh, we'll work with you. And, on donne le soutien en français, en anglais, en franglais, a little bit of both. And um, I, yeah, that's pretty much that. So uh, I've left or we've left our contact info in the presentation. Yeah. So anything around learning disabilities, accessibility or assistive tech, please reach out to us. Mm. Thank you, both of you. That's really cool. So I guess it's my turn. Um, so this is the Reciage service offer that we did present uh, in a couple of places. And we've just taken a few slides to let you know what, uh, what we have to offer for you. Um, <clears throat> the way that, so there are four uh, consultants who work, Abby, myself, Emily, and Giovanna. And the way that we work uh, is that we each have a separate dossier and they work together. So as you notice, the cogs turn and as each cog turns, it turns another cog and they have to work together or else uh, nothing moves forward. So that's the way we've been working for, on, we're going on our second year is working together. And uh, so far so good. We each have, as I said, separate dossiers. So if you're looking for center for teacher support, there's Giovanna, uh, digital interactive resources, Emily with the project rise. Uh, you just heard of Avi with accessibility and assistive tech. <clears throat> Pardon me, I'm supposed to be communications and I have a frog in my throat. Um, so anything that has to do with communication. So when you, if you're on our uh, Facebook group, uh, that's me writing most of the newsletter, but that's changing. Uh, my colleagues are helping me out with that. Uh, I, I send that out to you. Uh, try to get on Twitter, our websites, and trying to update them as much as possible. And I'm also uh, uh, on every possible committee, I think. Um, and the, the idea behind it is not just uh, to sit in the committee, but to be actively searching for things that I can bring back to the Anglophone community and to share with the consultants and to share with you. 
So a lot of the French committees I go on and uh, uh, try to bring what I can back to, to you. And then I use e either the website or uh, the newsletter or the Facebook group to diffuse that information. Just gonna click very quickly. Um, we have a live chat. So in case you wanted to reach out to us. So right now I'm logged on, it says live chat. And you just click on that little button and you will be in contact with me directly. Uh, if it says leave message, then that message goes to all four of us. And uh, so one of us will pick up. So please understand that when you talk to one of us, you talk to all four of us. And um, whoever is more, more, more likely to, to be helpful will be the person to contact you or we'll work something out. So don't be shy. All right. So we're at the question period now. Um, I'm just wondering if anybody has any questions or any comments. We did compile all of your questions and we're going to go through them uh, right after. But before we move on, does anyone have any questions or something that we can help you with before we move forward? We're all good. Please don't be shy. What we're going to do is we're going to go through these questions. There are actually quite a few of them. Um, and each, uh, each of the organizations will be able uh, to answer them as we go along. So Matthew, are you ready to give me a hand? Because I think my voice is gonna fail very soon. We're good to go? All right, so I'll share, my, okay. I'll share my screen again and we'll go down the, this list of questions, all right? What kind of networking exists between high schools and adult ed centers? That's an EPC question, thank goodness. I don't have to answer that one. Uh, that totally depends on the school board that you're working for within the province. Um, some school boards, there exist none. And some school boards, um, the adult ed center is actually in the high school. So it is really dependent on uh, which school board you're working for within the province. And uh, if you would like to know, more information, uh, you could contact your local EPC consultant and they can let you know at the at your local level uh, what that networking and collaboration uh, looks like. All right. Any questions? That's a cool question, though. It is a really neat question, yeah. All right, so we'll move on. Matthew, go ahead. Okay, what's the best way to record a short lesson for future use or to send to a student? Hmm, I wonder if someone from RAC might be able to field this one. I think Giovanna has, has a good answer, if she's available. <laughs> Giovanna is available. Oh, yeah! It really depends on how comfortable you are. Um, you know, you can use Screencastify, you can use Loom. Uh, these offer the possibility of, uh, you know, you can have your little face in the corner or nothing or just the screen. Um, you can also use like a QuickTime player or, you know, if, if you're doing something externally, you can actually just use your phone. Um, I've recently had an experience where I didn't like to see my face in the corner. So I just disabled that feature and I just had my little, my little picture in the corner. So any of these tools, like I said, Loom, Screencastify, QuickTime would allow you to, um, to uh, do a little quick uh, lesson. And I would recommend flipping it. So you'll have the students watch it before and then do something interactive. I, I guess people can reach out to you if they need a hand with uh, using those. 100%, that's what I'm here for. <laughs> All right, thanks, Giovanna. Um, this is an interesting question. I think it's a, an EPC one. Uh, I'll just boil it down. It comes down to what are different adult centers doing across the province to attract students? What kind of things do people do to attract, do centers do to attract students because of the numbers that tend to dwindle as we go along? I'll jump in again, I guess. All right. What a, what a great question. Um, we work, we do work together. We work together as committees, as the EPC committee, um, which works with the AJAC, so the uh, Adult Educa Adult General Education Committee. Um, keeping in mind Matthew's roadmap, the AJAC committee is made up of consultants and administrators. 
Um, and at every meeting where we get together, we share what's going on in our centers, what our what our current state is like. Um, this was vital for our survival during uh, the pandemic because we needed to hear what people in red zone, green zone, orange zone, we don't know what color zone we're in. Um, but we also share um, ideas in terms of diversifying our offers of service, of uh, sharing different types of programs that are being developed and tailored to meet the needs of students from around the province in lots of different contexts. So um, it's a great way to network and share. Uh, and it, this is not, I'm not giving a specific example because there are specific examples for every single school board, but uh, know that members of your administration and your consultants are sitting on a committee sharing ideas. And um, if you hear of some interesting or sometimes it might seem like a cockamamie scheme, uh, it may have come from that table where we did put our heads together and come up with how can we meet the needs of the students and attract more students so that we can keep everybody working uh, and learning. So I, I know that's not very specific, Mark, but I don't know how specific we could be. That sounds good to me. So there's some, there, there is an active search to, to try to attract uh, students, but uh, we can only do what we can do. Well, thank you very much. This person had two questions. So second question, go ahead, Matthew. I'm also very concerned about our francisation programs within an English school board. They're not receiving adequate government funding for our students. What can be or is being done? Um, does anyone feel um, equipped to answer a question about uh, francisation? I, uh, I would have to be the one answering that question for you as I am in charge of languages and social sciences in Egyptian pedagogical. And it's, it's really ironic that the question should happen uh, to pop out tonight as I have a meeting tomorrow morning uh, about exactly that. So if you are willing to let me, leave me a little note in the chat uh, with a specific questions that you may have or who uh, this question is coming from, I would gladly, gladly go get back to you as soon as I have uh, met with my, uh, my supervisor. So I can see the answers in the, in the chat right now. So thank you very much. And I will get back to you, I promise. I like that, that's serendipity. That's cool. All right, uh, practical strategies on how to continuously engage students with online learning. Somebody uh, from AC. Your creativity is the only limit. Um, I mean, check-ins, that's, you know, that's one of the ways to do it. Have like, um, I would, you know, I advocate for putting everything online. That's the first thing. So your students have um, a place to always access things. Uh, keep in mind the IE in RAC is innovation and technology, right? So it's ways of um, keeping the students occupied. So involving the students in what you're planning to do. You don't have to create everything. You can have an idea in mind and, and, and empower the students to be part of that creation, uh, accessing resources, um, you know, Obviously, we have interactive tools that can um, that can support this, like you know Kahoot and Quizlet and uh, you know Mentimeter. Those things can also provide that additional novelty. Um, but just ways where you're just checking in continuously with the students. Um, I, I'm just going to call on Emily. Emily, I don't since uh, you're you you haven't. We haven't pointed to you yet, but you're doing fantastic work with your RISE 2.0 project. Did you have something to add particularly for this question? Yeah, I added a couple of resources in the chat. Um, one of which is the PDL La Carte website that we'd set up during the pandemic that has some resources about designing online learning experiences. And the other is Catelyn Tucker's blog. So she is like an expert on blended learning, which is not the same as online learning because blended learning often does take place within a classroom setting with the use of tech. But a lot of the strategies that she has in there 
um, like the use of stations, for example, some of that stuff can be used in an online setting too. Thank you. God, I work with really smart people. Matthew, go ahead. Go ahead. Oh. Where do I get help? Okay. If I could answer this question, you know, um, but uh, hopefully today's presentation illuminated this a little bit more. Um, <laughs> there you go, Emily. That also helps. Um, so um, yeah, the, hopefully the presentation clears that unless someone wants to get a bit more specific here. I think we'll, we'll move on to the next question or. All right, all right. Yeah. <laughs> uh, hybrid teaching. That's a, you know, that's, that's a, a pretty tough, uh, tough one though because it's hard to teach online and in person at the same time. And we, we tried to help teachers all year last year and whew, that was a rough one. So if he's, I'm gonna ask my AC colleagues because we got this pretty uh, techie stuff. So any uh, comments that you would like to add, something you wanna talk about? So if you absolutely must, have that, that hybrid model where you have face-to-face -face and online, I would recommend treating them as like using like what Emily was suggesting earlier, that station model where you have your work organized in, in a digital space and you um, <laughs> manage um, the groups accordingly. So the online people are doing something while you're addressing the face-to-face -face, and the face-to-face -face are doing something while you're addressing the online. So that's the first way of like addressing that. You know, can you imagine I'm dealing with you and I'm dealing with somebody else, another group over here. It just, it, it just doesn't, you can't take care of everyone. The class management piece, that's like 101. That's why I always advocate for everything being digitized. The ones in person can print it if they need to, but at least you have that virtual space where everything goes there. You plan your stuff, you know, co-creation of also learning objectives might allow for the students to work on their own, to, to have their, their pace, calendars, uh, organizing your, your content. Like Matthew also uh, had his, 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 his slides with certain colors with different areas, how you organize your content is also going to help you mitigate all of that, uh, all of that fun stuff that you have to contend with. That's pretty good. And if you are having uh, difficulties, uh, you know, please reach out to your local consultant or reach out to AC. We're, you know, we're all here to give you a hand. Six B. How can a teacher keep individuals interested in attending class online when it is individualized learning? Okay, anyone have experience here with individualized learning? We did, we had, a, we offered French four or five individualized stuff for the past two years online. Um, the teacher organized um, a lesson for the whole group um, at the beginning of each class so that the student, and it's language, so that's a little bit easier than if you're um, offering multi-subject, multi-level, then you would really want to focus on learning strategies versus uh, subject specific uh, content. But this teacher would organize um, a little mini lesson at the beginning of her class with uh, something that was good for all learners in French as a second language. Uh, and then put the students into breakout rooms where they were in like course codes or similar course codes. If you're familiar with the French 4 or 5 program, there are some overlap in content in secondary four and secondary five. So sometimes the students were in mixed level breakout rooms, but still content, uh, similar content uh, and given little tasks to do. And she would go from breakout room to breakout room. Um, the students felt supported and, and uh, actually all did very well, but it, it was a lot to manage. And there was a lot of support uh, for the teacher behind the scenes. Uh, she used her local consultant, her AC consultants, um, our beautiful, wonderful pedagogical consultants uh, did not exist yet. But uh, if, if Julie had been there, we would have been calling out to her too. So that's the, that summarizes. And just to go back to the last question mark where mm -hmm. Joanne was giving all of those amazing tips, 
Um, one of the things that I often remind teachers, and we'll all agree and nod, that uh, be kind to yourself. Uh, teaching in a hybrid context was never anything that anybody thought would happen. Uh, and it's, it's difficult to do. And so be kind to yourself and ask for help. You have all of these support people around you. So if you're in that context, don't feel like you need to do that alone. We, we all, all of these teams get, get paid to be helpful and we enjoy it. So. All right. Tips and, tri tips and tricks for multi-levels. It's your management. It's how you manage your, your, like your folders. And it's, it's like, you have to be a conductor. Who's going to do what, when, how are you going to allocate? Yeah, well, how much time are you going to dedicate to this group, to this group, to this group, have your stuff in one place where you can don't have to like go in and out of different spaces to populate and where you can direct your students to the same space. And it's, it's organization. It's really organization. How much time you're going to allocate to each student, uh, not to each student, but each course. Uh, this is, uh, and I agree with you, Giovanna, 100%, but I'll also recommend for something like that, it may take a little bit of a, like a little bit of time at the beginning, but if you actually connect the subject on multi-level, like you, you look at a subject from sec one to five, and see the progression, like where is that subject leading to? So that if you have that in mind, like where they are and where they're supposed to be, then it's easier kind of to take the same task and level it up. Just add that layer every time. So yes, it is extremely tedious at the beginning, but it's worth the investment because it has two purposes. One is to, to for the students when they work together, they'll see that there is a next step and this is not a waste of time, that it's gonna be built upon it. So ideally, instead of just teaching levels, it should be taught by subject. So if you have an idea like saying, okay, I'm starting, let's say with addition, but I'm going towards like a complex task where I have to apply it into something a lot more complex, is that build up. It's like taking a complex task and breaking it down into steps and say each level is a step. I know it sounds like tedious, but it could be done. So you're looking at a program as a whole versus a, a module. That's a very interesting way to look at it. Thank you, Ms. Lynn. Go ahead, Matthew. Yep. What are some helpful methods to ensure that all of your students are participating and moving forward in their individualized education? I think we've kind of touched on a little bit of that. And, you know, it's, a lot of it has to do with organization and planning and, and sort of seeing things. Emily, do you want to add? Go ahead. Yeah, um, I stuck a link and Judy is echoing this a little bit. She's saying daily follow-ups with each student. So I stuck a link in the chat to Catlin Tucker's blog. You might have figured out by now that I love her very much. Um, but she has this like excellent um, conferencing protocol that she uses with students to help them set goals, to help um, follow up with them about, uh, you know, issue, things that they're having trouble with. Um, and, and she does this like regularly. She also has, she has like another one that I'll try and find where students, um, like a more student fronted document than, than this one. But yeah, having those individual check-ins with students um, where you're kind of breaking things down and you're uh, curriculum wise, but you're also building that relationship with them. That's, that could be super helpful too. Okay. More technology in class to help teachers push students to achieve their goals. So relying on technology to help people move forward. Can I answer that one? Sure. Okay, so I would just say, like I looked at that question, I was thinking of how to best answer it. I would say every class is different. And I'd all say it's not always about the tech. It's about the learning goal first and then seeing what tech um, can help address those needs. So it could be about using the student devices. It could be using what's in the center, but it really goes back to what I said before. It's not always about the tech. Learning goal first, what tech can be used to help address that. 
That's my answer. And we can certainly help you with that, both his CEPC and even the Cape Shook. I mean, we all have an eye on that. What is andragogy? Another one. Hopefully, we covered this in our presentation today. Keep going, Matthew. Okay. What support is available for the assessment of undiagnosed learning exceptionalities with adult learners? So this is, I mean, this is going to, I'll, I'll take, I'll, I'll, I'll try this one. This is going to vary greatly um, from center to center, right? So assessment, um, I mean, if you're talking psychoeducational assessment, you're going to need to, uh, you know, a private assessment is the only way, right? Um, and that's unlikely for a lot of adult learners. So really, um, you're going to want to collaborate with your um, resource teams. Um, if, um, if you have one on site, your special ed techs, if, techs, if you have access to them, will have specific strategies for supporting um, students with exceptionalities. Um, and uh, my quick answer though, and like I think uh, many here will, you know, back me on this and Avi in particular is, um, you know, learn a little bit about universal design for learning, right? Um, it's, um, it's a framework that's been around for quite a while. And the idea is, uh, or one of the ideas um, is that you um, use strategies and provide resources that are required for students with exceptionalities um, to um, to to succeed and thrive, um, but that also benefit everyone else, right? Know that if you are learning about um, everything from how to use fonts to um, uh, assistive technology for a student with dyslexia, um, whatever you put into place for them will benefit the other students in the class. So I would say, you know, go at this one from a UDL approach and you're gonna end up catching more students um, than you would have thought otherwise. So I hope I hope that's a little bit helpful. Very neat. Anything to add, Karin and Avi? No, I think Matthew, you covered it really well. Definitely UDL. Um, I know there's some boards, for example, Nicole and Sonia are doing a big push around UDL at Riverside, um, you know, helping the teachers become aware of that. And Matthew, you also said it varies from center to center. That's what I'm learning in this position that every center is dealing with things differently. So I think you said if, it you're, if you're looking for like a benchmark type tool, there is the Canadian Adult Reading Assessment, CARA, um, and that's um, uh, um, an appro uh, a test that you can anyone can administer. You don't have to be um, a psychologist um, or um, uh, you know some kind of specialized educator, and it's just a, it's a series of reading comprehension um, qu uh, tests that you can administer. But there's a whole methodology for figuring out, figuring out which test to provide to the student. Um, and it's not particularly expensive. Anyone can administer it. Um, and at the end of the day, um, reading level is a big indicator, right, um, of, of certain uh, learning exceptionalities. Um, and, and I've used that actually with, um, I, I once gave that test to an entire class and I saw that like in an, in an adult education classroom, you have students with reading levels, you know, ranging from grade four to college level, all in one class, right? And not multi-level I'm talking here, you know, um, but just having that data was really important for me as a teacher, but it also helped the special ed tech who was um, providing not support to my class individually, but that I had access to. So that's the Canadian Adult Reading Assessment. If you just Google CARA or reach out to me, I can help you locate that resource. Thank you. Uh, tips for teaching. Oh, this is a really interesting question. Some tips for teaching senior learners with special needs. Lower functioning population often present as having reached their maximum potential. So where do you go from there? Um, don't want to pick apart the question, but like, we often have this concept of, you know, a person having reached their maximum potential, or especially when it comes for people with cognitive disabilities, that this notion that they perhaps can't translate their learning from one space to another. And a lot of that actually informed um, some of the program developed for this particular population, um, the social integration curriculum. And um, in my experience, a lot of the um, objectives um, 
that we thought a student with a certain uh, uh, disability would not be able to complete or demonstrate, um, they are able to complete these goals. Um, so, uh, so in terms of teaching tips, I'd say, you know, uh, don't be afraid to try things with this population and, you know, manage, you know, and adjust your expectations in a good way. Um, it's very possible the student will surprise you with what they are able to do. And a lot of it has less to do about what they're able to do in terms of how you're um, able to measure that. What activities do you design that sort of, you know, um, uncovers what we perhaps thought that the person could not do? Um, but that's a pretty specific question. And don't hesitate to reach out to me if you have like a specific profile or person in mind, like anonymous, of course, but that we could we, we could talk about and I could maybe give you some more specific resources there. That's so that's my like philosophical response to that question. <laughs> okay, works for me. Okay, EPC, what do you think? How do we help students keep an interest in learning? Or Kipchak or Hasib, and we're all here for that, right? Well, I, I could just say something really tiny is to make it interesting in learning, actually get to know your students and their interest. If you know what they like, then they're most likely that they're gonna actually see the relevance of what they're learning and they'll be more interested. But if they, if you bring like a subject that they have no interest in, it's not even about the discipline anymore or the learning, it's about not being interested in general. And uh, give choices. Another one would be really, really good is give choices the empowerment of choosing you could give them like a whole like let's say for example if we look at math give them like a page and say okay pick four out of ten and that that empowerment of making choices will give will give them the incentive to say okay i could get to i could be part of this this is not imposed on me i'm actually making choices i'm going to pick two and four and whatever you know by giving choices uh, get to know them, take the time at the beginning to know them and their interests. I think that is a winner. And try different things. And sometimes you may not reach everyone, but you may reach some. So diversify your learning in terms of visual, kinesthetic, uh, audio, and, and typical, like just the, the variety in teaching is the best because it's not monotonous, it's just dynamic. And they don't know and keep them on their toes. They don't know what's coming next. You know, there's there's a period that they know it's always the same. And there's a period that where it's, we don't know what the teacher is going to bring today. Maybe an object or something. And let's look at it differently. So try. Show them that you're vulnerable too, that this is new to you too. And it's okay. We're learning together. I think that is very empowering. And if I may add uh, on top of what Mr. was just saying, uh, we did address that uh, in, a, in a workshop we did on empowerment and engagement. And it's really about the relationship that you build because it's not just about asking questions at the beginning and getting to know them, but really get, keeping up with that knowledge that you have of, of your students and let them know who you are as well. And um, they sometimes look and sound like they're awfully uh, off the grid, but anecdotes the uh, tranche de vie, those are all things that make your students more interested because they know they're coming from uh, they're coming from somebody who's interested in them. The more you tell them about yourself, the more you're showing them interest in themselves because you want to keep that channel, the openness in the relationship and the engagement. Joanna? Thank well, you. That's, I mean, that's like, mwah, they, they articulated it so beautifully. Uh, I mean, how do you know how to plan if you don't know who your audience is? Like, I mean, you know the level, but you're still, it's still human, right? It's that human connection. That's how you're going to connect with them. I mean, anybody could read a book. Anybody can do exercises online. The adult learner can figure this all out by themselves. Like we can all figure it out, but they're with you. You have an opportunity to capture them. So if it's like that, that if, like if you don't care, not that we don't care, but if they feel that you don't care, they won't care. But if they feel that they're cared for, there is more likely that they'll 
I always say my students would jump out the window for me, not because I'm a better teacher, but because they connect with me. So when they connect with you, then you can get them further. Audrey, you would put your hand up. Thank you, Giovanna. Um, I'm just gonna I'm just gonna say like make it real. Like you need to bring the learning to a real life situation because we are working with adults. So it me it needs to be meaningful. It needs for them to they need to be able to use that learning in their life. So it needs to be real. Thank you very much. We're almost there, folks. Uh, I love this question. I'll just speak in French right now. Dans la présentation, vous allez voir deux sites web qui sont du récit. Alors, en premier, l'après-co où on, nous sommes présentement, il y a une panoplie de, de formation en français, des outils, des, des documents qui vont avec. Alors, c'est vraiment de faire le tour. Aussi, avec votre euh, euh, courriel à la commission scolaire, vous, avez, vous aurez accès par euh, Google ou Microsoft au campus ici. Et là, on peut faire des, des, euh, des formations, euh, des auto-formations, finalement, euh, sur beaucoup, beaucoup, beaucoup de sujets. C'est une question d'aller voir tout ça. Si jamais vous manque euh, ou vous avez une, une idée en tête, « Ah, j'aimerais ça », euh, travailler cet aspect-là ou cet aspect-là en français, euh, contactez-moi, allez sur le site web de, du récit, live chat, vous allez voir, je vais vous mettre en, en lien avec euh, quelqu'un du récit côté francophone, puis on essaiera de trouver ensemble de, de, des solutions pour vous. Micheline. Juste pour ajouter aussi à cela, euh, vous avez les formations nationales mathématiques qui est offerte euh, pour toute la province au complet. On a beaucoup de formations. Euh, C'est sûr que dans le secteur francophone, euh, il y a plus de formations parce qu'il y a plus de, disons, des, pas d'experts. Ça a été développé avant euh, le, le, le secteur anglophone. Mais dans le secteur anglophone, on va avoir aussi des, 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 des formations nationales mathématiques. C'est que vous avez le choix d'aller sur ce site aussi. Vous allez avoir accès à la formation en mathématiques aussi. Thank you. It's Up all to you. what age can you stay in the adult education sector? Oh my gosh, there's no limit. 16 and up. I guess that's it, is that it? 100 or more, right? People are living <laughs> pretty poor these days. <laughs> All right, I'm going to stop sharing my screen. And uh, well, we made it right to front one minute past. There were so many interesting questions that I just felt that, and, and we really do appreciate you taking the time to write to us. So I hope that we've answered some of your questions. Go ahead, Emily. I just wanted to mention that I added two slides to the presentation, Mark, if you wanted to bring it back up again. With upcoming après cool. So you can Ooh. save the dates in your calendar to come back and see what there is to see. Yeah. So when when you get the when Richard puts this all together in a lovely video package for us, he'll also put a whole bunch of links to resources. So here are the dates and the themes for our upcoming cross curricular après cours and. Our lovely Equipe Shock colleagues also have some upcoming subject specific après cools as well. So be sure to stay tuned for those. So that's it, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you so much for coming. Uh, as, as we've said, uh, we're here. If you have questions for us, don't hesitate and have a, a really, really good evening.